Thank you for checking out Murder Dictionary Podcast. I just wanted to give a quick disclaimer that we are still learning the ropes of audio and podcasting in general. The sound quality and content will get better as we get more experience, so please bear with us through this learning curve. We focus mostly on the murderers, so some listeners may feel that the subject is approached too lightheartedly and with a lack of focus on the victims. Although we want to be sensitive to that, we cannot help but focus on the details or facts that we find most fascinating. And for us, that is often the life of the murderer and the details of the crimes. We appreciate you checking us out and hope that you are also interested in the stories that we are intrigued enough by to explore. Check us out on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, and don't forget to subscribe on iTunes. And thank you for tuning in to another episode of Murder Dictionary Podcast. My name is Brianna, and with me is Kelly. Yo. What up? Before we get started, I just wanted to make sure to remind you guys that we are on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Definitely follow us on there if you want some memes, serial killer facts, statistics about cool shit, Mm -hmm. Florida news, (laughs) a lot of people with face tattoos. (laughs) Um, as well as our Patreon. We are on Patreon. I had a question the other day about what that is, and it's basically um, a way for us to give monthly rewards. So you can sign up for that and do donations, and then we want to give back to you. So we'll do bonus content. We're coming out with stickers and buttons. So if you do uh, sign up to our Patreon, definitely make sure you send us your address because we want to get some merch to you Yeah, and, and say thank you. I'll come by and give Eskimo kisses <laughs> <laughs> for $5 donation. And I will give you butterfly kisses. <laughs> <laughs> Good combo. So we will include the links to all of that at the bottom of the description and show notes. And in addition, we wanted to thank a couple people that gave us five-star reviews. If you leave us a five-star review, we want to say thank you on the show. So first off, I wanted to say thank you to McGogwin. I think that's how you pronounce it. It sounds like a Harry Potter thing. So I feel like I should know that that's the right way to do it. It sounds Native American to me. Uh. (laughs) McGogwin. So McGogwin said, uh, you guys are hilarious, but still stay focused on discussing murder. We appreciate that. And Phoenix Down Farm said that if you like true crime, check them out. They're really engaging and entertaining. That is awesome. We really appreciate you guys. Thank you so much for your positive reviews and your positive feedback. So this week we are on the letter I and we are doing inheritance. So since we probably all know what that is, I didn't really prepare any intro or any definitions or any backstory like that. I just figured, let's get straight to the murder. I like how I didn't know. I was like, do you mean? (laughs) When I came to Kelly, she was like, is it this or is it that? You mean money or genetics? (laughs) (laughs) Stupid. <laughs> so we're talking about money. So, so when then immediately dies. I was just like, well, maybe I should have put something together <laughs> explaining what this is. <laughs> I, got, I mean, there was only two options for me. So, you know, so we're talking about money. So when people die. Yeah. They get so money. that we are talking about basically people that kill off their family members mm-hmm. or um, husbands and wives. It could be and then inherit their money. We're going to start off with Nicholas Newall, who was a teacher and wealthy heir to a Scottish shipbuilding fortune. His wife, Elizabeth, came from a successful farming company family. The pair was affluent enough to spend most of their time traveling. I'm so jealous. Yeah, me too. Let's build ships. <laughs> <laughs> I'm down. Can we do little ones in a bottle? I do. And put no them in a bathtub? Yeah, you got to fucking figure that one out because that, <laughs> pos- that has fucked me up for life. I was like, how do they do it? <laughs> I've always thought that too. I have no idea. I feel like they just add water and it grows inside the bottle. <laughs> It's like those little sponge animals. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) 
On a 1967 trip between the UK and France through the Channel Islands with their two young sons, one of the boys became ill. They stopped in the Channel Island of Jersey to take him to the hospital. They enjoyed their Channel Island detour so much, despite the health scare, that they decided to relocate to Jersey. The island is a place that many wealthy Europeans live or visit on holiday, similar to the Hamptons or Orange County in the U.S. That's a right comparison, right? Orange County, that's where the rich people are. I was yeah. thinking Malibu, too. Malibu, yeah, Orange County. I uh, told you, more KKK members in Orange County than... Yeah, you were telling me crazy. that. So they're like super rich and super racist. Yeah, sweet, sweet. place. Yeah, good times. <laughs> The Newalls bought an extravagant home where the pair settled into an active social life, participating in many activities and parties with other wealthy socialites. What, like oppressing people? Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> Figuring <laughs> Just out. Just grand keep... wizard meetups. <laughs> <laughs> they traveled a lot, and as the boys became older, Nicholas and Elizabeth decided to enroll their sons, Mark and Roderick, in a prestigious Radley boarding school. God, I bet you they play cricket, too. That's what I was oh, thinking. Oh, yeah. Ugh. A lot of rowing. <laughs> <laughs> water polo. Oh, mm-hmm. I like water polo. Rich dude sports, for mm-hmm. sure. Golf. <laughs> <laughs> they provided for the boys monetarily, and their sons had many experiences that less affluent kids would not have access to, like golf. But this did not make up for their absence. Oh, they probably had snack packs and everything, too. <laughs> oh, the good snacks. That's not a rich kid it's thing, not? dude. It's not Is really about wealth eating, dude. Oh. I thought it was. Like, back in England. Snack packs. Gushers. <laughs> did your parents not feed you, bro? <laughs> they did. <laughs> they just, I always wanted to trade my snacks. So. Oh, well, that's like a kid thing. Yeah. I think that's just normal. Everybody wants to do that. That's true. My mom was kind of like, you know, a health nut. So there was always just the weirdest snacks and i always wanted just a pudding cup or like you know one you know of those what? chewy bars i think those are the actually the poor kid snacks yours your quinoa fucking shit is the affluent <laughs> you're the fucking you're, you're the, we definitely didn't have a lot of money but my mom was like i'm not eating bullshit you uh-huh. know See, and i hated it I would have given an arm for like sugared cereal. That's all we had. Just <laughs> oh, fucking no. rice crispy snacks. I had snacks. nothing but granola. I was like, fuck this. Uh, <laughs> that's why you have beautiful hair. No. <laughs> and I'm going bald. How can I? <laughs> it's all the granola. <laughs> the secret to the hair success. <laughs> Roderick and Mark were not good at academics, but they did excel in sports and were said to have been pretty popular. The Newell sons hated boarding school and resented not being able to live with their parents. I don't know why parents would think that this is a good parenting tactic to just get rid of your kids. Yeah. When has that ever worked out? Uh, When they want to go on vacation. (laughs) (laughs) When they're in Spain. Yeah. (laughs) But it's fucked up. Of course your kids are going to hate you. Like, what the fuck? And most boarding schools are like all dudes too, right? Like, isn't it usually all the Mm -hmm. same sex? Really waspy dudes. Mm -hmm. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. Even during school breaks, the boys were usually sent to stay with an aunt or uncle instead of being able to spend time with their parents. Even when they were home, the parents I were like, no, <laughs> they didn't even why go home. Oh, yeah. Man. I'm confused as to why they did that as well. I mean, it's a choice to have a child. Yeah. So why are you going to have kids if you just don't want them around at all? Tax purposes. <laughs> <laughs> that shit's crazy. Yeah. So all through their schooling age years, they rarely saw their parents. While the boys attended school and stayed with other family members, their parents, Elizabeth and Nicholas, traveled the world, either on their yacht or at one of their various vacation homes. Ugh. Yep. (laughs) (laughs) Friends and family members recall that they usually didn't even spend Christmas with the boys. What? I know. Pretty much any time, even as an adult, if I can't spend Christmas with my parents, I just cry. My, if my parents don't want to spend Christmas with me, they're getting fucking fired, okay? I'm unadopting <laughs> my parents. That's it. You're yeah. out. <laughs> you mean you don't want to spend Christmas with me? <laughs> the fuck? When they did see their sons, they often just criticized their lack of academic success. Right? Oh my you guys God. should see Kelly's face right now. Jesus. <laughs> That's brutal. Perhaps in an act of rebellion against their parents' wishes, the boys did not want to go to college. I would fucking kill my parents, too. I'm already like, just kill them and spend the money. Like, seriously, I would. Like, I mean, I wouldn't, but 
I don't can victim see blame, why. dude. I mean, you don't give a shit about them. You have tons yeah. of money and you're just going to go blow it and you're fucking chilling on yachts while we're at school. Yeah. And you're not helping me do my homework. You're not doing anything. And then you have the balls to criticize my academic success. You can go fuck yourself. <laughs> Ugh. Chopping you up into the tiniest pieces. I'm going to take my time and <laughs> chop you up hard. Oh, my God. <laughs> I'm putting you in a blender. That's what the fuck. This is beyond victim blaming. <laughs> that's victim blaming? It's called taking responsibility for your actions. Okay, there's oh consequences when you treat your kids like shit. <laughs> okay, maybe I am victim blaming. I'm sorry. <laughs> Like they weren't doing tons of coke on their yacht while their kids are gone, you know. Oh, just of course, chilling. there's no doubt they were super shitty parents. Yeah. but I think you know you have to be a murderer to fucking murder someone. You know what I mean? Like, um, or just insane for a second and just really <laughs> mad. I'm really salty about a situation. <laughs> I've wanted to murder someone for like standing me up on a date. Okay? Oh, shit. <laughs> I got dumped once, and I was like, how do I kill this person? <laughs> oh shit. What could I do? Each episode, I'm just learning how close you are to murder. Yeah, but that makes me a really patient and restrained person. So Sure. Yeah. Until you're not and someone dies. <laughs> Thank God I don't drink alcohol anymore. I know, right? <laughs> that definitely helps me feel more safe. Yeah. My brothers uh, make a joke and call me uh, the Hulk. Oh, so, shit. So, you know, when I get mad. You- <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You are pretty crazy. Yeah. Also, even when you're happy, when you're a happy drunk, you are completely insane. <laughs> but not insane enough to chop up my parents. So, but insane enough to literally swing a dildo at me once. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like you were trying to hit me in the face with it, like it was a fish or something. <laughs> I was like, dude, that's not cool. <laughs> it's like a love tap. I mean, it's cute. Oh man. After boarding school, Mark moved out on his own, then started working in finance and banking while Roderick joined the army. Roderick was arrogant and rebellious, often smoking weed in the army barracks, even though if he was caught, he would have been kicked out. I'm going to fuck Roderick. (laughs) I'm just kidding. (laughs) That's your type, for sure. (laughs) Mark was more reserved and introverted, while Roderick was more of a brute and a charismatic ladies' man. Family friends also recall that while Mark was in finance, Roderick was really bad with money. In the early 80s, Roderick got into some financial trouble. Since he owed money, he asked his mother for help. Even though his parents were spending excessively on traveling and living an extravagant lifestyle, she refused to help Roderick out of his predicament. When she said no, Roderick reportedly punched his mother. Oh, man. I wonder if she still said no. She's like, yeah, well, I'm still not giving you money. (laughs) Now you owe money for punching me in the fucking face. Jesus. The family decided to not involve the police in the issue, and eventually Elizabeth forgave Roderick. Mark was very upset, but he was very scared of his brother and would not stand up to him. That is fucking crazy. I can't believe they didn't call the cops. Yeah, or she could have just beat the shit out of him with something, a bat. I mean, just handle it family style or whatever. Just take care of it. I don't think that's considered family style, bro. That's not family style? Like, no. you beat me up and I beat you up. I don't think up. it's normal to just beat the shit out of each other. No, I'd be like, we're going to fight here at 720. I'll meet you here, Mom. We're going to fucking duke it out. Catch me outside, motherfucker. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh, my God. I don't yeah. care if it's my mom. <laughs> By the mid-80s, the brothers were in their 20s and becoming concerned that their parents were beginning to dwindle down their money with the constant travel and partying. This worry was heightened when they sold their large family home where the boys grew up to move into a small bungalow. To be fair, they didn't even actually grow up there. They were in boarding school the whole time. Yeah, but apparently they had a really, really nice house Mm -hmm. and just downsized to something the size of a trailer. Yeah, what's a bungalow? like? Yeah, hmm. just a really small house. Hmm. Oh, I've only heard about bungalows in like school. Right, that's what I envisioned too. Half-ass built, like we just put a shitty thing there. (laughs) Called it a room. Handicap accessible for show. Yeah, they were. They always had ramps. Yep. (sighs) Yep. (laughs) And when you walked on the ramps, they just shook the whole building. Yeah. You could hear people coming in and out of the classroom. Hollow all the time. as fuck. Yeah. Yep. You knew They're someone basically was tin tool sheds. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Great learning environment. With AC. As long as I had AC, <laughs> I'm fine. In 1986, soon after the move, their investment in Lloyd's of London insurance started to decline. 
Even though Mark advised his parents to withdraw the money, they ignored his plea and the Lloyds of London market crashed. Mark found out that his parents would need to pay huge fees to Lloyds and this obligation to pay monthly would only end once Elizabeth and Nicholas were deceased. When Mark told his brother about the debt, Roderick began to think that the longer his parents were alive, the less money the brothers would inherit. So he started to devise a plan. It is sound logic. <laughs> Makes perfect sense. In October 1987, Roderick asked Mark to join him for a birthday celebration with their parents. Roderick was plotting to kill their parents while the rest of the family was planning a birthday celebration for Elizabeth. The brothers flew to Jersey and headed to their hometown. In the afternoon on the day of the birthday celebration, Roderick rented a red van and bought shovels, plastic tarps, torches, a saw, a pickaxe, and some cleaning solution. Ugh. Yep. That's... Nar -nar. How about a gun? <laughs> <laughs> okay, about yeah, it seems cyanide? like he's trying to do it in the most violent and crazy way possible. A pickaxe? Yep. Torches? Yeah. Huh. And a saw. What is he going to do? Like a creme brulee on the top? Is he going to slightly gonna toast them? It? Yeah, caramelize my rents. <laughs> Damn. That night, the Newell family went to dinner at a nice local restaurant. The wait staff said it looked like they were having a wonderful time. Mark was the designated driver while everyone else drank. The family arrived back home after midnight, at which point Mark said goodnight and left back to where he was staying that night. Elizabeth went to bed while Nicholas stayed up to drink and talk with Roderick. They talked about his direction in life, which is always a great conversation to have with your family. <laughs> Isn't that the worst? Yeah, no, <laughs> Just really. like, that's the last thing I want to talk about. While you want to ask drunk. about school and work? And, yeah. Come on, dude. Just talk about the guys I'm getting, Dad. Don't talk about this. You're being a real bum out right now. Let's have another drink. <laughs> Jesus. Nicholas was being critical of his path as usual, and Roderick was sharing that he wanted to leave the army. By 1.30 a.m., the situation had escalated to a heated confrontation. Like most booze right? conversations. <laughs> that was, of course, going to go that way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Nicholas was criticizing the state of his son's life, and Roderick was accusing his father of neglectful parenting. They should have just gone to therapy. No, but they should have they gone to therapy, for sure. Oh, yeah. Of... There's a simple solution. Come yeah. on. Talk about it in a healthy way. Talk it out. Hug it out. Right. Yeah. Hug it out, bros. Give me a couple hundreds. <laughs> you won't get killed as the argument reached a boiling point nicholas asked his son to leave but roderick refused nicholas pushed his son to the ground and roderick hit his head on the table as he fell although roderick had clearly brought enough supplies to kill his parents instead of proceeding with the plan he quickly grabbed nunchucks that were nearby and used them as a weapon what <laughs> yes so apparently earlier in that day, Elizabeth was doing some like spring cleaning or something. And they happened to have nunchucks at the house, probably that belonged to one of the boys. And they just happened to be in the living room or sitting wow. room where they were. Yeah. Crazy. If he fucking kills him with nunchucks, I mean. Just you wait. <laughs> <laughs> Roderick hit his father repeatedly on the head with nunchucks until he died. Oh, there it is. Yep. Then he went towards his mother and beat her to death with the nunchucks as well. After the murders, Roderick called his brother Mark to tell him that he killed their parents. And if Mark didn't come to the house immediately, he would kill himself too. With nunchucks? Right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, not to be a dick, but I would just be like, you killed our parents. I don't give a fuck what happens to you. That's the normal response. Uh, fuck you, you, dude. Yeah, you didn't call me. Uh, goodbye. Right? Friend caller, fuck. I love my brother to death, but if I got that phone call, pff, you should kill yourself before I find you. Yeah, because then you get all the inheritance. <laughs> <laughs> if, <laughs> if Mark was smart, he would have just been like, all right, for sure, I'm not coming. <laughs> You're right. He really fucked up on that one. <laughs> And he's the one that's in finance He's supposed and business, to be the so. smart one. Yeah. Come on. <laughs> Once at the house, Mark helped Roderick wrap the bodies in tarps and put them into the red van. 
They removed their clothes and gathered any evidence, then took the items to the woods behind their old childhood home. They burnt everything in a bonfire. They then drove the van to another wooded area and buried the bodies. They returned to the house and did an extremely thorough cleanup job, then turned up the heater to dry out any moisture left by the cleaning fluid at the crime scene. I just imagine them with like the Mr. Clean magic erasers. Just (laughs) (laughs) Just pausing to smile at the camera like (laughs) (laughs) a little sparkle in their tooth. (laughs) (laughs) The next day, they went to the airport and flew home. When friends and neighbors noticed that Nicholas and Elizabeth had not been seen around for a few days, the boys were asked to return to Jersey for questioning about their missing parents. They questioned the brothers alone, and detectives were frustrated that during Mark's interrogation at the parents' home, Roderick was barging in and yelling at the detectives for questioning them. They said that multiple times, Roderick would storm into the room screaming at them, and they had to repeatedly ask him to leave. You guilty. Yeah, you're guilty as fuck. Just be like, hey, calm down. Don't look guilty. Like, Ask if you a planned lawyer. this whole thing, wouldn't you think through your behavior? Yeah. Come on, man. I think the whole nunchuck thing really threw him off. He, he just, <laughs> his whole plan just spiraled out. Just get a lawyer and be like, mm, you know. They weren't charged with anything, though. This is not, they're just being questioned because their parents are gone. So it's not like they needed a lawyer. You know what I mean? Yeah, but they're questioning to find out where their parents are. Oh. Because their parents are missing. There's no bodies. Oh, okay. Yeah, but I don't know. I've just got a problem with any law enforcement asking me questions. <laughs> You're like, get a fucking lawyer yeah, every before. single time. <laughs> They're like, we're just asking you which direction we're supposed to. <laughs> lawyer. I need a lawyer right now. Like, I need a lawyer just at all times. Kelly asks for a lawyer during routine traffic stops. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Ma'am, do you know why we stopped you? Lawyer. Right now. Just roll up my window and just put my license on the front. Mm-mm. <laughs> There were some inconsistencies in the brothers' statements, but not enough to charge the young men with anything. See, so if you didn't talk to them, they like if you gave them a reason to charge you with something, that's why talking to them is bad. Because if you fuck up and say anything wrong, yeah, then they're like, "Oh, we got you." But it still makes you look guilty as fuck if you ask for a lawyer when your parents are missing. They're not murder victims at this point. Well, you—that's true. But you're damned if you do, you're damned if you don't. You ask for a lawyer, you're fucked. You don't ask for a lawyer, you're fucked. (laughs) I'm not a good liar. (laughs) Weeks went by with no progress on the case, at which point detectives brought in specialists to look more deeply into the Newell home. Even though there was no evidence visible to the naked eye, there was microscopic evidence found, but still no bodies to prove that a murder had occurred. When the boys were shown evidence, they were both unresponsive. Still, nothing conclusive to prove murder or that Mark and Roderick were involved. So the case remained cold for years. And they lived happily ever after (laughs) in Puerto Rico. Right? In January 1991, after three years and no progress on the case or reappearance of the missing persons, the boys filed paperwork to officially declare their parents dead. At this point, they gained access to their inheritance, which was approximately one million pounds. It would have been, I think, I want to say it was either three or four million Mm dollars converted to today and also converted to U.S. dollars. Okay. Roderick quit the army, bought a yacht, and sailed to Brazil to begin a new life. At least they waited longer than the Menendez brothers. That was guilty as fuck. (laughs) That was insane. (laughs) I can't even believe that that shit happened. (laughs) It's just sometimes I'm like, how the fuck stupid are you? Yeah. You know, <laughs> way to look guilty, man. No, really though. Like, I I'm feel like buy growing this. up in LA at that period of time, that's why I'm into true crime. Yeah. Like that's not the only reason, but that's a big part of it. Is like seeing the OJ trial yeah. and the Menendez trial mm-hmm. when we were kids. Mm-hmm. I didn't even know enough to know what was going on, but I knew that I wanted to know. Yeah, <laughs> it started there, right? But that was a crazy case. Yeah, all of, both, all of those. Um, at the same time, though, with the Menendez brothers, retail therapy. You know, when you're sad, <laughs> y- I would you go know, spend shit. I'm just shit. trying to recover from the loss. Yeah. And I'm going to buy everything in this store. Yeah, Can you I know get people- seven yeah. of this? <laughs> I'll take the half right of the store. Like, I mean, I would do that. You can never have enough crew neck sweaters, I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> oh, that's what they I need for. just every Rolex in this case. <laughs> It'll make me feel better. In July 1992, Roderick returned to the UK to visit his family members. Over dinner, he made a comment to his aunt that he knew what happened to his parents. Well, shut up, shut up, shut up, shut up, shut right? up. <laughs> Fucking idiot. He was going to his uncle's house the next day in Scotland, so his aunt called the police and detectives called the uncle to set up a sting operation. Roderick met his uncle for lunch at the hotel where detectives had set up a surveillance team. The conversation didn't turn to the murder for a long time until his uncle asked about what Roderick had said to his aunt. Roderick told his uncle that the bodies were buried, but he did not divulge further information. Can you take a confession when people are drunk? I just get everyone drunk. Be like that. <laughs> you'll talk. You're about seven minutes. You'll talk. Three shots later. I just think that he had to have known that his family would tell on him because it's their family members that he killed. You know what I mean? And just burning yourself out like, oh, I know where the bodies are. So basically, you're just like, yeah. I was involved in this. Yeah. Uh, he was the arrogant one, right, though? He probably yeah, was like, he just mm, was like, they'll never turn me in. They like me better. Right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the Jersey police did not have the jurisdiction to make an arrest for a Jersey crime in Scotland. So they tried to follow Roderick as he drove back to London. They lost him, at which point Roderick drove to a ferry and went to France. He was on the run for a week when his yacht was spotted near Gibraltar and he was arrested at sea. That's fucking rad. You know, a bunch of boats <laughs> were like, Meh, pull over. Why don't you fucking pull over? <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. The police apprehended Mark in Paris as well. Roderick was held in custody in Gibraltar pending the discovery of additional evidence to support his extradition back to Jersey. The detectives tracked down Roderick's girlfriend from the new life he started in Brazil, and when questioned, she said Roderick had confessed to her. She had one of those big Brazilian asses. Of course he said something. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, baby, I'll tell you anything. That Ask ass. More questions. That <laughs> ass, yep. Roderick's extradition to Jersey was granted, and on the flight, the detectives asked him to indicate on a map where the bodies were buried. He provided a general area, so the detectives took Roderick to the site where he said he buried the bodies. Roderick pointed out multiple spots for the police to dig over multiple days. That's pretty funny. <laughs> He's like, oh, it wasn't there? Okay, Oops. try here. <laughs> I thought I left breadcrumbs. <laughs> It seems although he appeared willing to cooperate, he was sending detectives on an embarrassing hunt while the paparazzi watched. Eventually, the bodies were found after three days of digging up multiple sites. The sedative phenobarbital was found in Nicholas's system, although it is unclear whether he was taking the medication himself or drugged before the murder. The medical examiner also said that the wounds on Nicholas's head were more consistent with a pickaxe instead of nunchucks. <laughs> I would imagine there's a big difference between the two. Mm -hmm. It's purely a speculation as to whether this means there was more than one perpetrator or if a second weapon was retrieved part of the way through the attack. Or it was nunchucks because there's two of them and he just do 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 do. <laughs> it's definitely nunchucks. <laughs> You're going with that. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Roderick gave a full confession that led to a guilty verdict, and he was given a life sentence. Although the evidence of a second weapon has led some people to believe that Mark had a bigger part in the murder than he claimed, Mark was only found guilty of assisting and covering up the crime, which earned him a six-year sentence. He was released after only 20 months. What? Yeah. Although it was disputed by other relatives, Mark was given access to his parents' assets. No! Yep. <laughs> he won. Right? Fuck. Mark received millions, as well as multiple houses and a yacht. In 2007, after only 13 years, Roderick was released from jail. He was reunited with his brother Mark, who has become successful through investing his inheritance. And although the brothers faded into obscurity, it's assumed that Mark gave Roderick some of the inheritance money as well. I hope so. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> he fucking murdered their parents. Yeah, I mean, 
he served time too. You know, no. that's so fucked up. No, it's so <laughs> fucked up. That's awful. And I can't believe they were given such a light sentence. Yes, that is crazy to me. Come on. He's probably a fucking saint in jail. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> Oh, man. Yeah, I can't imagine how they got out so quickly. 13 years and he killed two people. Yeah, two people. Some people kill one person and get right? more time. Some people get caught with weed and get <laughs> do more. It's just insane to me. I don't understand how that happened. And then he's a millionaire now. White privilege? Are they white? Yeah, that's it. <laughs> okay, yeah. <laughs> uh, all right. You want to move on to the next story? Yeah, hold on. I got to... <laughs> get that drooliness under control. I can control. already feel it. I think I just... As soon as it's your turn, you yeah. just get way drooly. It just starts salivating. Like, I'm Aww. excited. It's like a <laughs> fucking burger in front of me. Jesus. Aww. Okay. You got to help me with this. The uh, ruby? I it's... think it's her ruby. Okay. I didn't know if the H was silent. You got this. Got it. The Ruby family was well known in Duncan, about 80 miles south of Oklahoma City. The Ruby family owned a newspaper called the Duncan Banner for three generations before selling it in 1997. John Ruby bought the Marlowe Review in 2007 and the Com- and the Comanche County Chronicle in 2013. I mean, these are bad years for print Papers. press. Yeah. <laughs> you, know, like, you would think that like you were you were doing well in 97. Mm-hmm. Eventually, just get out, right? Yep. But whatever. Anyway. He was named VP of the Oklahoma Newspaper Foundation Board of Trustees, which is part of the Oklahoma Press Association. John Hubey worked as the publisher of the Marlowe Review, where his wife Joy worked as well. They had two teenage kids, Catherine and Alan, who were also active in the community and popular at their school. Neighbors recall that they were a good family who were involved in the community and always willing to help others out when they are in need. A neighbor said they would always help you out If your car wouldn't start, they'd come over and jump it. Or if your dog ran off, they'd try to help you catch it. Just neighborly things. Although family, friends, and neighbors really liked the Rubies, there was some less than positive chatter about their teenage son, Alan. Some people said he was always laughing and joking, but other people in the community felt that Alan was not as genuine as the rest of his family. People said there was something arrogant and a bit creepy about the Ruby's son, Alan. Alan was known as a skilled high school tennis player. Yeah, definitely a douchebag. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Tennis equals douche. And arrogant. Yeah, I get it. <laughs> Alan's Facebook profile claimed he was an aspiring male model and volunteered at Duncan Regional Hospital. Ooh, not a good sign. <laughs> <laughs> Tennis, aspiring male model. Right? I mean, volunteering school. That's nice. <laughs> After his time volunteering at the hospital, Alan started saying he wanted to become a plastic surgeon. I volunteered in a hospital. I was a candy striper. Wait, Me wait. and a shit ton of old ladies. Wait, like you come in like a candy gram, but a, like, oh, a stri- striper or a stripper? That's what they called it, a you, candy striper. You go in and like, dance and give lap dances to old people. <laughs> <laughs> that was later. <laughs> that was after high school. <laughs> like, we got a gift for Ethel. <laughs> <laughs> kind of. It was weird. Me and a bunch of old ladies in a room waiting for like phone Pudding? calls from different departments, like <laughs> so we could deliver different things and go help out certain places. Oh. I was the only person under 70. I what? shit you not. <laughs> wait, old, oh wait, I thought we were going to an old folks home. I thought no. old people volunteering at an old home. I was like, how no. can you tell the difference? Between- <laughs> <laughs> they just keep trying to take the lady back to her room and she's like i don't live here <laughs> who's in charge here oh my god <laughs> the Harubi family was quite wealthy and teenage alan often posted about the extravagant purchases he was making or places he was traveling it was like one of those douchey like kids of instagram or rich kids yes. or whatever oh Fucking i dick. hate that they're always on yachts always <sighs> everybody like nobody wears real clothes yeah just always bathing suits oh my god Boo. <laughs> <laughs> While other kids were documenting their friendships and various activities, Alan was putting up pics of his designer brand items or his trips to Rome, Paris, and London. Oh my God, I can't even afford that now. <laughs> I can't even <laughs> like afford to go to every one couple place. years I go on vacation. <laughs> yeah, I can't even afford to go to Utah. Like, what the fuck? <laughs> I can't even afford to go to San Diego. <laughs> I know, right? I was going to go to San Francisco recently. I was like, nope, that's not happening. <laughs> no, yeah. Even with Airbnbs, it's like, no. Yeah. You need a deposit? <laughs> I guess we're staying for one night. (laughs) Even though he was still a high schooler, he often traveled internationally alone without his parents. 
That's just crazy. He's a fucking teenager? What? Yep. Oh, man. Alan was close with his younger sister, Catherine, who was known as a sweet girl and dedicated athlete. I wonder if she played tennis, too. <laughs> <laughs> no, she seems nicer. Oh, cool. <laughs> Volleyball, I think. Softball, too. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Soccer. <laughs> Alan supported and encouraged her being on the volleyball. Oh, volleyball team. Exactly. Ooh. Nice people sports. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> short, short, tiny shorts. Oh, man. Volleyball Woo-hoo. booties. Yep. Over age. Over 18 volleyball yes, booties. Yeah, to- college. That's what I mean. College volleyball <laughs> yeah. booties. <laughs> A schoolmate recalls that when Catherine got in a car crash, Alan was completely devastated. Although they were close, Alan's behavior started causing conflict in their family. Alan had a spending problem that caused a lot of issues with his parents. Cut off the spending. How about that? Sometimes I don't understand how these things happen. It just seems like, oh, you just shut it off. That's it. No more money for you. The end. Cut up that visa. Right? Or whatever American Express black card, whatever they have. Or whatever rich, rich people work, you know? Yeah, I don't know. I've never been that. I Maybe he just cried and like kicked and screamed a lot until Probably. he got his card. Although his family did not approve of him traveling and buying designer brands, Alan told friends that his wealthy family could afford to pay for his spending habit. So it really didn't matter that he was a shopaholic. What a fucking asshole. <laughs> yeah. That's so messed up. Like, yo, they can afford it, yeah. so whatever. They're fucking rich. They're That's fine. just terrible. It doesn't matter if they can afford it. Just stop spending your parents' money. Yeah, get a job. Seriously. I got caught smoking weed and had to get a job right I mean, right I think after. you should get a job no matter what. Yeah, you babysitting know? Babysitting or something. But yeah. Character. It's just you should have a job in high school, mm-hmm. period. You got to earn things. And if you don't, then you end up being a murderer. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Fact. <laughs> <laughs> Alan said, my shopping wasn't something I or my parents could not pay. They just thought my spending was out of control. Whatever. But didn't want to do anything about it. Right. I mean, that sucks. By 2012, it became clear to the Ruby family that Alan had a very serious problem. On one occasion, Alan had a confrontation with his mother, Joy, over his spending addiction. <laughs> Instantly, that Kanye West, a single black female addicted to retail. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> Alan, <laughs> Alan reportedly assaulted his mother while they were fighting about money, but no charges were ever filed. It's so sad when you look back in hindsight and you're like, this could have been stopped in so many ways. They should have filed charges. And it's hard. It's so hard when your kid is going through something and you need to hold them accountable. Mm-hmm. But eventually they have to learn one way or another, you know, and uh, you don't really even sad. have to file charges. You could still have them spend a night in jail for assaulting Something, you and then yeah. drop the charges. So then they learn what it's like to go to jail. Right. Not There's like I know anything about that. Inform- <laughs> 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 like that has not happened to me specifically. <laughs> <laughs> but you learned. I learned. I never know? did it again. <laughs> <laughs> the family turmoil did not curb his spending habit. And in 2013, the Rubies discovered that Alan had opened a credit card in his grandmother Janice's name. Janice brought the credit card paperwork to John and Joy, at which point they called the cops. Alan maxed out a $5,000 credit card in Janice's name while vacationing in Europe. The Rubies decided to turn Alan in for the crime against his grandmother, and charges were filed against him for the fraudulent credit card. Alan was put on a delayed sentencing program, which is a form of probation, for young first-time offenders. At least he's being held accountable Finally. eventually. Yeah. Yeah. Way to go for the grandma. Yeah. Because you know? she's That's... like, this is unacceptable. Even if the parents aren't doing anything, I'm just telling them they have to. Yeah. You know? Way to go, Janice. Go, Janice. That's a great grandma name. Yeah. He was required by the court to pay restitution. He's probably going to take out another fake credit card. Right. <laughs> <laughs> pay that back. Undergo addiction evaluation, attend drug and alcohol counseling, and complete a cognitive behavior program. He would be required to reappear in court to discuss his progress, but he would not need to do any time in jail if he followed court-required program. Although he was in trouble with the law, Allen did not slow down his spending or financial fraud. By August 2014, Duncan police were investigating him again for check fraud. Allen had begun using fake checks and had defrauded various businesses using checks totaling up to $17,500. In mid-2014, he stole his mother's credit card and racked up charges without her knowledge. The family decided not to turn him in for his violation, knowing that he would be punished for the violating the terms of his court-appointed program. Like, his parents never want to hold him accountable. Nope. It's so sad. I feel bad what happens to them, but it's just there's so many points in which they could have intervened, and it's sad that they didn't, you know? Yeah. I don't know if 
I could too, because you always want to like think that someone's gonna change, or maybe yeah. they will. But I mean, obviously, he's not showing a good track record. But where the fuck is Janice? <laughs> <laughs> you just hold out that hope that it's gonna get better yeah. with any addiction. It's just like this Absolutely. is gonna change. They just need the right set of circumstances or opportunity or you know whatever support from us, and it's usually codependency that they're like, if we act right, he'll get better. Mm-hmm. But. That's not how it works, you know? And turning him in would give him another, you know, he'd have to pay restitution again. So, I mean, right. this time it's like 17 grand, 18 grand. So you're going to have – it's just going to be like a vicious cycle. They where probably to... knew that they'd be part of paying that. Yeah. Like, I, I can understand how it happened, definitely. Yeah. But it's just really sad that he wasn't held accountable. Because if he was in jail, they would be safer. Mm-hmm. <sighs> and they'd have money to spend. Yep. Yep. Mm. The family's longtime housekeeper, Rose Chavez, recalls that in September, 17-year-old Catherine came to her distraught over her brother's recent fraud and spending spree. The housekeeper recalls that Catherine was crying and said, Alan's up to his old tricks again. Catherine had also been informed by classmates that Alan was going around telling his friends that he was going to end up killing his family. The housekeeper tried to comfort Catherine and reassure that Alan was probably just venting to his friends and blowing off steam. That's not how non-murderers blow off steam. (laughs) (laughs) If you don't murder, then you're not going to say that. Like, Yeah. I, mean, I wouldn't say, I'm going to fucking kill them. Yeah. Like, or I'm going to kill them. I would just be like, oh, they suck. Right. So hard. It's one thing to be upset or frustrated with the situation. But when you say that, I mean, come on. There's something wrong. Absolutely. And he's told multiple friends. And he t- like now Rose knows. Like, I feel yeah. like. Yeah. Everybody could see this coming. Like, something is going to come to a head. And nobody, nobody did takes anything. him seriously. Yeah. Alan had recently started college at Oklahoma University and was political science major. Politics. (laughs) Money laundering and money fraud and politics. Huh. It's a calling. (laughs) (laughs) At least he's on the right path. I mean, he's got a goal. In September, it is reported that the Rubies were livid to learn Alan spent almost $20,000. Alan had also taken out a $3,000 loan from an unknown lender and was stressed out about needing to repay the money as soon as possible. At this point, the Rubies were livid and threatening to cut off Alan's finances altogether. Alan needed money to pay his debt and travel to Dallas, where he wanted to attend a college football game in October, but his parents refused to give him money for either request. Alan was so furious that his parents had refused to give him money that he began to devise a plan to get rid of his family and take their money. On Thursday, October 9, 2014, 20-year-old Alan left the Oklahoma University campus and headed to his parents' house. Before leaving, he posted pictures of his college campus and made a point to say on social media that he was at his dorm in order to prove he was at school that night. He decided to leave his cell phone on campus so that if the police checked cell records, his phone would ping him to the campus instead of his parents' house. Alan went to his father's pickup truck and took his dad's 9mm pistol to the house. This is a lot of planning and premeditation. Yeah, absolutely. There's no way he can argue anything other than that, you know? It looks pretty foolproof at the moment. <laughs> I'm sure he thought that too. This he was is... just like, I'm never going to get caught. Yeah. Look at where I am on Facebook. He's got a, <laughs> he's got a checklist, like right? left phone at home. Check. <laughs> Check into my college. <laughs> yeah. Facebook post. Check. <laughs> Alan first found his mother, Joy, in the kitchen and shot her. She was still alive after the first shot, so he got closer and shot her again. While Alan shot his mother, his sister Catherine was outside washing her car, so she ran inside to see what was happening, and Alan shot her once. Alan sat down at the dining room table and waited for his father to come home. John Ruby arrived home an hour later, and as he walked into the dining room, Alan fired once at his head. Alan recalls that John said, ouch, and fell to the ground, but was still alive. Who the fuck says ouch? That's so weird to me. I don't know. I've never heard someone get hurt and say ouch. (laughs) I think I do all the time. Really? I just... Throw out curse words. Actually, some of my coworkers make fun of me. <laughs> I'm always hurting myself. <laughs> Super clumsy. I need to hear you say ouch now. I'm going to hurt you before we're done today. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> I mean, oh, no, don't do that. <laughs> Alan got closer and fired a second time. Police believe that none of the victims saw the gunman before shots were fired at them. Alan left five spent 9 millimeter shell casings at the scene. Following the murders, Alan disconnected the house's DVR system that was connected to the home surveillance system. He took evidence and surveillance equipment to a nearby lake and threw the items in. Afterwards, he traveled to Dallas to attend the Oklahoma University versus Texas football game. Ruby called his college roommate after the murders and asked him to bring his football game tickets to the Ritz-Carlton in Dallas. 
The pair spent the weekend staying at the Ritz-Carlton Hotel, attended the game, and partying with other college students. Throughout the weekend, Ruby posted photos of himself and friends having a good time. Creepy. This guy sucks so hard. I'm always really creeped out by people that can just carry on like nothing mm-hmm. happened and then just hang out with people, have a yeah. good time, laugh and joke and party. I can't imagine. Well, that he doesn't thing. care about his family. He does. He he did. He accomplished his goal and he got yeah. away with it so far. He's so happy. He's just. I know. I'm at the Ritz Carlton. He probably took a bath. <laughs> Get some bubble bath bubble up in bath. that bitch. Yep, popping <laughs> champagne. Ugh, what a douche. Oh god. <laughs> he checked into the hot tub at the Ritz Carlton. <laughs> <laughs> what a fucking asshole. Had some like bubble emojis. Yeah. <laughs> In the bathtub. <laughs> just a selfie of him with a duck face just covered in bubbles, like a little on his nose, too. <laughs> just like makeshift bubble pasties. <laughs> <laughs> Covering his little nipples, <laughs> his little rich nipples. <laughs> or like the Chris Evans whipped cream bathing suit, yes. but with bubbles. <laughs> uh, probably got a rubber ducky made of solid gold. Oh, oh, shit. Wait. oh wait, that wouldn't float. <laughs> gold plated. You just hear a big clink. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> his college roommate Andrew Borman who stayed with him that weekend says he was shocked to learn what Alan had done even though he saw him within hours of the murders Andrew said Alan behaved completely normal Andrew said there was nothing that I could detect that was wrong with him which is one of the weirdest things everyone else who has seen him and talked to him said there was nothing wrong there were no red flags that's one of the scariest things is that I was with him just alone in his room hours after he shot his family and I couldn't tell that there was anything wrong that he was completely normal is kind of terrifying. I would be so freaked out. Yeah, I'd puke. Oh my, <laughs> seriously. Yeah. I mean, that is fucking terrifying. Mm-hmm. Back in Duncan, Oklahoma, coworkers were concerned that John and Joy did not show up for work on Friday morning. John also never showed up to cover the weekly high school football game, which he always attended every week. Friends and coworkers waited to see if they had heard from the Rubies, but days went by and nobody knew where they were. On Monday, October 13th, the family's longtime housekeeper, Rose Chavez, arrived at the Ruby's house to begin work. Chavez says she arrived at the home around 8.30 a.m. and was going through her usual cleaning routine for the first half hour of her day before she realized something was wrong. I get kind of blurry in the morning, too. I'm just on autopilot. Oh, man, me too. I'm not a morning person. She, I can imagine myself not noticing yeah. some bodies for a while. Yeah, and then you have that first sip of coffee, and you're just like, hmm. Oh, there's, this doesn't look oh, right. Oh, <laughs> She said it seemed odd that the food and water bowls for the family's dog were overfilled and all of the home's cabinets opened. Rose then stumbled upon the body of Joy Ruby in the kitchen. She got closer to find a heartbeat, but said the body was ice cold. She walked further and saw Catherine's feet. John was between the doorway to the kitchen and dining room face down. Police arrived and called Alan to notify him of what happened at the family home notify him like we need you to come down to the office then <laughs> like, well, or to the station the police were operating under the assumption that he was just away at college oh, like yeah, you know he just wasn't there i forgot he was know? at college yeah witnesses described alan ruby as behaving very nonchalant cold and callous when he arrived at the home after the bodies of his parents were discovered because Allen crossed state lines to attend the game that weekend, he had violated the terms of his parole, which allowed officers to take him into custody for questioning about the murders. Awesome. Yes. I love that things lined up right just mm-hmm. to get him into custody. He doesn't have a choice. He doesn't. He right. Has to come There's down. no option. He has to answer questions. Allen confessed to the murders, but argued that the tax did not happen because of shopping. Mm-hmm. Lawyer up. Right. You just got that money. I mean, I, I hate say to say that it. every time. Well, it's just. <laughs> I know he's an awful shitty person, but there's still the whole the judicial system. You can just be like, hey, I need a lawyer and then prolong it. But yeah, I mean, I don't know. Maybe I'm just terrible. I'm like, lawyer up immediately. I don't care who you are. <laughs> and I'm just like, fucking get him. Yeah, get him. <laughs> Especially for attacks like this where it's brutal and on your own family. Yeah. Like, I don't know. I mean, we've talked about the Innocence Project and I know that there's times in which, you know, you see things like making a murder Mm -hmm. and the interrogation issues that happen there. And I can understand how crappy that is when someone didn't do something wrong. Mm -hmm. You should get a lawyer at that point. However, these people fucking interrogate them, ask them all the questions, charge them, get it done. Yeah. It just, uh, yeah, it drives me crazy that people get away with so much shit. Yeah. I'm glad the cops did their job and they did it well. And yeah. But 
still i just like, still, just lawyer, fucking uh, ask for it like at least you made it this far you killed your parents fucking try try and get out of it like <laughs> but you just i don't know i don't like quitters <laughs> damn go big or go home okay the district attorney's office obtained a search warrant on October 24th for a storage building that was rented to Alan's grandmother, Janice. Nothing good ever happens in a storage building. Absolutely not. <laughs> That's all, all the bad shit goes down there. They opened the unit. Wait, what happened to you in a storage unit? <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to talk about it, man. It was real sexy. <laughs> I used to hate storage units because they were so scary and like someone like my parents would be like, okay, go wander around for a second, like down the hall, which is Dude, what? Scary. God, your parents just drive me crazy. <laughs> yeah. They're going to go do something <laughs> in their storage unit. I just run through and then I was like, I'm lost. Like yeah, everything looks the same. Everything. It's a fucking maze. Smells like cardboard boxes. Oh God. Ugh. Yeah, no. Yeah. I love my dad. Let me just not say that. I talk <laughs> I a mean, lot I of shit. I mean, I love your dad, too. Yeah. I'm just saying that's kind of – that's yeah. a little irresponsible. How high were my parents? Yeah. Could, that's what I think all the time. They're going to say they weren't, but they – No, they were. They had to have been. <laughs> then they're incredibly ridiculous. Like, <laughs> and there's no fucking excuse. But there was also a shit ton of you. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, Wait, like because I was that- fat? <laughs> No. Thanks, bro. <laughs> we all know I was we a little pumpkin We all know you grew kid. into a swan. D- yeah. God damn it. <laughs> a swan that's like, wah. Fucking wah. That's me trying to ask people out. Want to go on a date with me? <laughs> no, man, because you had so many siblings. It oh, was yeah. just like, you guys were like the fucked up Brady Bunch. Oh, yeah. So, of course, they couldn't keep track of you. And they were just like, hey, go play. Yeah. Because there were just so many. <laughs> <laughs> that's true <laughs> I'd be high too thinking about all the kids they had oh, I'd yeah. be stoned as shit <laughs> like, mm. they opened the unit and immediately observed evidentiary items in the storage space on top of a crate by the door the detectives found a 9mm handgun believed to be the murder weapon and blue nitrile gloves Ruby pled guilty to three counts of first degree murder why would you put the 9mm like drive across town ship the gun out. I don't know. It just makes no sense. I don't away. understand. He's terrible at this. But that happens all the time. Like, you did all this planning ahead of time. Yeah, it's a little... And then all these things at the end, you were real sloppy. You can fucking make fake checks and do all this fraudulent right. shit, and there is you can't some... hide a gun. Dig there... a hole in your <laughs> local park. I don't know. <laughs> I guess there's some sort of, like, subconscious, maybe he was wanting to get caught oh, or yeah. something. There's got to be an element of that, you know? And it's something you're unaware of, so it's not like you could say it, mm-hmm. you know? It's like, I'm just going to put this handgun on top of this box in case they search. Like, right? <laughs> fucking idiot. Alan maintained contact with the press throughout the trial and wrote a letter to the Oklahoman. He said, I 100% welcome the death penalty. What occurred is so horrible that it is deserved. It is so unspeakable. You're probably right about that subconscious. Yep. Yeah, you nailed it. He expressed that he is still trying to understand what made him turn on his family. When the housekeeper, Rose Chavez, gave her shocking and emotional testimony, Alan cried and trembled, repeatedly wiping tears from his face with tissues. But the prosecuting team was adamant that he was faking his emotions for sympathy. I don't trust a tennis player either. (laughs) (laughs) Tennis players don't cry. (laughs) The charges carried a possible death sentence, so he struck a plea deal for life instead. Alan's grandfather, Richard Stein, submitted a letter to the court asking for swift justice and for his grandson to be sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. His grandfather said, We feel that if Alan is given the death sentence, I will go to my grave not seeing justice carried out. Family members feared that it would be a lengthy trial and years of appeals with no concrete resolution for elderly grandparents. Judge Ken Graham honored that request and accepted a plea deal for a life sentence. As part of the sentence conditions to ensure the victim's family would get closure, the court required Allen to waive his appeal rights. The plea agreement restricted Allen from contacting relatives or speaking to the media. The plea is also stipulated that Allen cannot profit from the crimes in any way and that he would have to explain the events of the murder in court. The family made sure that the plea deal let Allen know that he is no longer a member of their family and they intended to isolate him as much as possible. The prosecutor said, No one is going to hear from him again, and I think that's a good thing, especially for his grieving family. He is currently in prison already, serving three consecutive life sentences without the possibility of parole. 
John and Joey Ruby were later inducted into the Journalism Hall of Fame. No, no, that's sad. Yeah. Don't be rich. Don't give your kids money at all, ever. <laughs> I'm never doing that. My kids are going to be so fucking broke. Oh, my God. Jobs right away. Yeah. Go mow the lawn. You get 50 cents. <laughs> my da- <laughs> That's what my dad did to me, and then I got a job. He'd be like, oh, you want to go to the movies? Let me pull out my bag of quarters. Do you have a Ziploc? <laughs> I'm like, no, nah, dad, I'm cool. I'm, I can't. No, no, no. Just trade them in for dollar bills. And- Wow. No, I'll get a job. <laughs> How embarrassed were you? So fucking embarrassed. <laughs> That's probably why I bought a bunch of Snickers bars and shit like that. Because, you know. You're like, I can't take this in movies. Yeah. I got to think, buy things that are $1. $1. And, time. and it makes sense why I'm using quarters. Right? So, yeah. <laughs> Didn't My murder anyone. were the same way, though. It's like if you want something, you have to earn it. Yeah. And so you do little things like allowance when you're really young and then you get older, you get a job. I think that that's a healthy way to go about it. Mm-hmm. And I don't – of course, I don't want to blame his parents. No, but it's not like at all. But there's certain ways in which you can kind of steer a child in the direction of being more responsible yeah. and a little bit more well-adjusted and healthy. And it yeah. really sucks that all these things lined up to yeah. create such a unhealthy situation. If I'm going to learn anything from the story, it's that, yeah, my kids aren't. I'm really going to just try not to spoil. Like, nobody likes a spoiled kid. Oh, yeah. Ever. That's bad. Yeah, even like just anything in general. Not like a, a not a credit two-year-old card. old is bad enough. Exactly. Then they become a teenager and it's just like, oh, shit. Fuck that kid. Yeah. <laughs> I hope his Facebook got deleted for sure. <laughs> yeah, that's a weird thing. Like people that are dead that still have Facebooks up or yeah. that are in jail and have Facebook. It's weird. I don't know. Yeah. Anyway, Woo. <laughs> those are some crazy stories, yeah. but I really like these inheritance stories. Mm-hmm. I know it's weird, but there's something really fascinating about it to me. I don't know. Do you so, think we need reform in a uh, life insurance policy? Yes. Like, I, something, there's right? something called the Slayer Law, which is awesome. Sick. <laughs> <laughs> Slayer. <laughs> um, I think that... I can't remember exactly what it was, but basically something similar to this where they changed the laws so that if you participated in anything that led to your parents dying, you were no longer eligible, eligible to yeah. receive their money. Fucking Roderick got money. <laughs> yeah. That's there's a terrible. few cases that that happened. But I think that after those, like after the 80s or mm-hmm. 90s, then it changed the laws. Jeez. But I think that that was only in the US. So in the UK, it mm-hmm. would be different. But anyway, I find them fascinating, so we're doing a goddamn part two. Woo! <laughs> Give me more stories. Right? <laughs> All right, guys. Thanks for checking out another episode of Murder Dictionary. We'll be back next week with part two. Check us out on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Backpage. Grinder. <laughs> PayPal. <laughs> I don't know. What's the grinder one for bears? <laughs> <laughs> What's it called? I can't remember. Scruff, I think. <laughs> That's where I'm at. (laughs) All the leather daddies. (laughs) My fave. All the links for any of the information in the stories today will be at the bottom of the show notes as well as the link to our Patreon. Don't forget to rate, review, subscribe, and we will definitely give you a thank you on the show if you leave us a five-star review. So thanks so much for checking out another episode, and we'll see you next week. See you later. Bye. Bye. And now, a thought from Geico Motorcycle. It took 15 minutes to take a spirit animal quiz online. Please be the cheetah. Please be the cheetah. And learn your animal isn't the cheetah, but the far less appealing blobfish. Oh, come on. To add insult to injury, you could have used those 15 blobfish minutes to switch your motorcycle insurance to Geico. Geico. 15 minutes could save you 15% or more on motorcycle insurance.